Thank you, everyone. I'm uh, so glad to be here. It's a little early for me, but uh, it's getting closer to when I would bring my kids to school this time. So my wife will, will take care of that this morning. So I'll be speaking to you today about America, China, the retreat of democracy in Southeast Asia, the case of Cambodia, which is near and dear to me since I'm originally from Cambodia. And it's really, if you were to think about it differently, it would be this idea of of uh, China and Southeast Asia from threat to charm offensive to threat again because of how China has essentially gone to, uh, to Southeast Asia as its neighborhood and um, provided all kinds of interesting infrastructure but also is essentially looming over that region as a kind of um, <clears throat> imperial power rising. Yeah. But first, let me give some thanks. Thanks to you for uh, uh, joining me and uh, for uh, uh, thanks to Mindy for making this possible. This is one of her covers from uh, February, I think it was, um, when, uh, when my family was featured. Anyhow, April, of course, is an important month for, um, for Cambodia. It's um, the anniversary, uh, I was on 17th April, the 43rd anniversary of the fall of Phnom Penh, where 1.7 million people out of five, six million people died, a uh, quarter of the population, including my father and my wife's father. And uh, I would talk some more about that, but it's not the topic of today's conversation. But if you are interested and available tomorrow at the library, Crisanda Le Crisanda Library, I am speaking about, uh, in, the, in commemoration uh, of Genocide Awareness and Prevention Month, along with an Armenian uh, poet who will share her uh, wisdom. So. As uh, was mentioned, I uh, was part of, uh, entered Oxy as part of uh, the Fall 2014 collection, um, which uh, was full of interesting characters, and even before Oxy, I had the uh, opportunity to uh, teach at the Naval Postgraduate School, as, I, as was mentioned, where I taught junior military officers how to rebuild countries. They were very good at breaking countries, uh, bombing them, but uh, what they wanted to know from me was how to rebuild them. And what I needed to tell them was that it wasn't like rebuilding a house. Uh, we've got um, architects here, I'm sure, in the room. It's not like you know you design a blueprint and you just build the country from that. It's much more like gardening as metaphor. So gardening is far more uncertain. Locals uh, know the land, the soil conditions, the weather maybe, but things are very unpredictable. You might know when to prune uh, as a local, not as a, an outsider coming in. Um, it's about really telling them, and it's the lesson I teach my Oxy students now, about giving up on the illusion of control. So gardeners have no illusion of control. We create the right growing conditions, nurture a healthy soil life, set our lifestyle so we have time to tend our crops and we plant a diverse variety of sturdy and uh, healthy plants and watch them grow. We adjust as we go along, removing excess weeds, uh, mulching, watering, and fertilizing when necessary and picking off pests. But ultimately, and this is the real lesson here, the end result almost always includes crop failures and unexpected successes. And we feel more like stewards, sometimes even observers and masters of our domain. So, I sound like the world's greatest gardener. Uh, I actually do this to my plants, so that be an answer, right? Um, but that's it. Let's talk about uh, China, America, and the collapse of democracy in Southeast Asia. Um, in January 2017, when President Trump entered office, one of his first acts, the first week of office, was to sign an executive order removing the United States from uh, the Trans-Pacific Trade Partnership, <clears throat> which of course, since then, the past few weeks has been overtaken by events because there's now talk about returning to the TPP, which has since changed into a different configuration. But the bottom line is right now we're not in the TPP, and the TPP was, was supposed to be 12 countries, including the US, but uh, is now, in fact, 11 countries. And the reason for the TPP are huge. I mean, we're talking about a trade deal that would have elevated um, uh, environmental labor and intellectual property rights something that we knew China was never gonna accept. So that's why we were comfortable that even though China could theoretically join the TPP, they would never join the TPP. They wouldn't wanna to accede to these standards that, <clears throat> that they're not interested in. And economic considerations are huge. 60% of US trade is with the Pacific region. Uh, you've got Asian maritime and regional security that are vital to US interests. You have 6% of the US population as Asian Americans, but it's more importantly the fastest growing uh, ethnic group. Asians dominate uh, the vast number of foreign students in America. You just look at the geoeconomic context. Southeast Asia here is 1.7 million square miles. Um, 
618 million people, uh, $2 trillion in GDP and 3,500 per capita GDP. You look at China, you've got even bigger numbers. Of course, the population 1.3 billion, $10 trillion in GDP, and that was in 2014, um, $7,000 per capita GDP, um, so twice uh, Southeast Asia's. The one thing that China has been promoting for the last few years has been this idea, uh, this um, <coughs> initiative uh, called, otherwise known as Belt Road Initiative, also known as One Belt, One Road, which is really this notion of about 900, perhaps even a trillion dollars in infrastructure uh, planned investments across the world, really, from Pakistan to uh, Sri Lanka to high-speed railways to in East Africa to gas pipelines across Central Asia. We're talking about China going global. And um, last, uh, in 2016, the amount of infrastructure announced was 50% of it was um, designated as one belt, one road. But the reality is that, of course, you know, it takes, it takes more than just announcing something for it to happen. Uh, so only 12% of that was uh, actually materialized. But you've got, you've got Obor, One Belt, One Road, even in New Zealand. So this is just to give you an idea of, of what we're talking about here. <clears throat> Literally, uh, planned projects across, um, uh, across uh, the world, but um, mm -hmm. in the case of, of India, I'll point out, you know, they've got only one activity here in Calcutta, but Sri Lanka has got, I mentioned, these ports. Pakistan has got activity there with China and Nepal too. So um, if you think about it, China is, is encircling India in going to India's neighbors and becoming friends with India's neighbors, which for China is, a, I think, a geostrategic consideration. <clears throat> China is using a win, 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 win strategy in this, and it's really a win for, it's really all across the board wins for China. What you're looking at is Chinese excess capital. They have, they have a lot of, of money slushing around. They need to do something with it. They were buying treasury bills from the US, but they're, they've decided to redirect those resources to uh, infrastructure. What they require of the receiving countries in terms of these loans is no tender process or to tender it to a Chinese firm, which is a win, another win for, for China because it's one of these typically state-owned companies that ends up getting the money. The, um, the companies then employ Chinese <coughs> workers, which are overwhelmingly men, who uh, in China currently there are 30 million too many men based on the demographics. So they need to find spouses anyway, so this is great for them um, <laughs> if they find somebody out there when they go out to work. Um, and if things go wrong, China has been doing a debt equity swap, which is to say, okay, you owe us this money from this loan we gave you, you can't pay the interest, so now we're gonna take over the actual uh, port that we built for you. And uh, they did this uh, recently in Sri Lanka with a 99-year lease, um, which happens to be the same amount of time that Hong Kong was handed to the UK. So this was the, the, the handover of the Hambanta, uh, Hambantota port concession. Um, uh, and it looks almost like a, a lottery check here that the Sri Lankans received, but it's, it's simply that they leased it out for 99 years, so get, they get, I guess, $292 million. What China is also doing is building infrastructure like um, the world's emptiest airport. Uh, also in that same province where it happens, the former president of Sri Lanka, uh, then at that time he was president. But China obviously was currying favor with him by, by building a bunch of infrastructure in, in his uh, home province. Uh, but it literally has, uh, it's like 10,000 square meters, um, uh, two airlines flying there. <clears throat> really not, not a good use of money, but they're not the ones paying for it in the end. Just, they just loan the money. <clears throat> it's not just roads, bridges, empty airports, and ports. Uh, there are private, uh, there's private investment in high rises and condos. And I would argue it's meant to make money, certainly, and it's also meant to launder it because in places like Cambodia, for example, this is a, uh, an artificial island that was created off the coast of Phnom Penh, the capital city of Cambodia. It's called Diamond Island, and you've got all these um, high rises suddenly, and uh, that project there, this one here, is called The Bridge, and it's, it's, it's been snapped up. All the units have been bought by Chinese investors, um, and they sit empty once, once built. So these investors are simply putting money into, um, they're, they're sending money to, to places like Cambodia to store, to, to safeguard their money in the form of real estate. And you see that in Hong Kong as well, where um, 
five to ten million dollar condos I bought, these people are not interested in renting it and renting those condos out. Right? They're, they're not. They're not. If if you, if 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 you're going to rent a five to ten million dollar condo, you can afford to buy a five to ten million dollar condo. So um, you're not there. It's it's almost like an insult to say, why aren't you renting it out? Why aren't you making money from it? No, they're just going to leave it there, and uh, and leave it empty. So you're ending up getting ghost cities like in China, but in other countries as they as this happens, as units are snapped up and left empty, driving up real estate prices. Now even the uh, president of China has said houses are built to be inhabited, not for speculation. And it's absolutely true, I mean, you know, I mean, it's true for China, and it ought to be true, I think, for other countries in which China does the same thing. Um, incidentally, if one is interested in what Xi Jinping thinks, um, he said in 2009 during a visit to Mexico, speaking to investors, uh, Chinese investors at the uh, Chinese embassy there, there are, few, there are few foreigners with full bellies who have nothing better to do than to try to point their fingers at our country. China does not export revolution, hunger, poverty, nor does China cause you headaches. Just what else do you want? Um, I mean, look, if you're trying to find an unguarded moment in which he's sort of speaking uh, off the cuff, uh, after, after this leaked out, they immediately said he was, you know, this was off the record. Um, but it's not just infrastructure, of course, it's also trade. And China's answer to, uh, to, the, um, <clears throat> to all of that has been the uh, ASEAN-China Free Trade Agreement, which encompasses two billion people. I mean, it's China plus 618 million people, uh, 452 billion dollars in in trade, a trillion by 2020. 90 uh, percent of uh, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations exports to China are tariff-free, and it's beyond that. It's also the Regional Comprehensive uh, Economic Partnership, which is really literally China's answer to the uh, TPP. So, if you think about the TPP, <laughs> TPP is 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 this circle here. It includes. Uh, it doesn't include the U.S. at the moment, but but um, uh, it encompasses some ASEAN countries, and you can see that, that the RCEP is including all of ASEAN and definitely several members of the, of the TPP as well. If you're thinking about the, the trade volume and the, the global share of GDP, if the United States were to enter TPP, it would represent 38% uh, of, of global GDP in terms of a trade deal. RCEP is still only at 28%. Global trade, 40% versus 29%. Um, still very significant, uh, but of course right now without the U.S., our um, T TPP isn't really much. To give you some idea of a conceptual framework, uh, what China is doing is also engaging in what's known as soft power. Soft power is an idea that, that you can influence by persuasion rather than coercion. So you're not going to put a gun to somebody's head and say, follow me. Uh, you're going to try to buy their, their um, you're, you're, well, not literally buy, although the original definition said that you couldn't actually use money in that sense. You had to exclude investment and aid and formal diplomacy. But subsequent definitions have included the possibility that you could actually invest more, and that's the kind of thing that China is doing. But uh, you think about it, Hollywood is all about soft power, right? Um, Korean pop, K-pop, it's about projecting South Korea's sort of culture to the world, um, things that, China, uh, that Korea has to offer. And uh, in the case of, of China, what it's done is in Cambodia, for example, it, it has the um, world's, you know, the, the largest Chinese language school outside of China is in Cambodia, and it has 15,000 students there learning um, Chinese. Uh, China has also shown its largesse by building things for Cambodia, like this uh, Senate building complex that includes a golf range. Uh, this was in 1999 when uh, there was an election in Cambodia, and a bunch of politicians had to find an, uh, a new place to, uh, to be stationed. And so they created a Senate, and so the Senate became needed a building, and so the Chinese built it for them. Uh, ten years later, the Chinese built for Cambodia a new council of ministers. <coughs> it's really massive, and its brutalist architecture here is <coughs> quite evident. Uh, you've got a sort of a pyramid in the middle, which was supposed to house the prime minister's office, a kind of tomb, but uh, he said it wasn't the right uh, uh, geo uh, mancing uh, feng shui direction, so he, he refused to use that, that office, so he had another building built. But what has Cambodia done in exchange for that? And, uh, the, the day before Xi Jinping, then Vice President of China, came to Cambodia, Cambodia uh, to sign $1.2 billion worth of deals with Cambodia, Cambodia sent back to China 20 Uyghurs uh, who, had, who were trying to get asylum in Cambodia, so they were sent back by charter plane <clears throat> back to China the day before 
the vice president, then vice president of China, shows up to sign $1.2 billion worth of deals. Uh, really, the, as naked as possible of a, an exchange as one can imagine. So, so yes, who, I, I'm not familiar with who those people are. The Uyghurs are, come from a province of China called uh, the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region. It's part of China, and they've been, they're basically they're Muslim, and and China has been um, uh, uh, suppressing them, and, and uh, frankly, you know, doing some some really terrible stuff to them. And so they, some of them somehow got to Cambodia crossing uh, other countries and uh, were about to be designated refugees by the UN Refugee Agency. And um, just literally days before they were going to find asylum, they end up shipped on a plane back to China where uh, in the, um, <clears throat> since 2009, so in the nine years since this has happened, um, they haven't been heard from since. I mean, it, it's literally gone into a black hole somewhere and disappeared. Wow. Yes. So they weren't available for comment on that previous thing from <laughs> Xi Jinping? No, I'm afraid <clears throat> not. They've not since said anything, frankly. Okay. Um, and China and Southeast Asia are a kind of, if you think about it, it's, a, it's like a Monroe Doctrine. Um, if, uh, other, uh, is anybody familiar with Monroe Doctrine here? Right, uh, America's backyard is Latin America, South America, so this is our sphere of influence. Uh, China sees Southeast Asia as its sphere of influence, its near, nearest neighborhood. And this kind of Chinese model of governance, especially now with Xi Jinping not having any term limits at all, uh, could be disastrous for a region nascent uh, with nascent democracies, weak civil societies. And it's obviously butting uh, heads and, and, and elbowing out regional powers like Japan, Taiwan, and the US uh, globally. So. Um, one of the reasons for <clears throat> China being interested in the region, of course, is the South China Sea, where there are uh, more oil and gas resources and maritime resources than China currently has within its borders. And so it is trying to use ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, uh, which has members that are claimants to the South China Sea, to essentially um, prevent it to, uh, from, uh, from, uh, from putting up a fight with China. And the, the easiest way to pre represent this is that really China is unitary in its actions while ASEAN is 10 members and tries to be unitary but really can't be because you, the way that ASEAN operates, one member can veto uh, anything that ASEAN does and then it doesn't pass. So this is a real challenge. You have an organization that works on consensus and so you just need to buy off one member of ASEAN and the whole thing fell, falls apart. So in 2012, with um, what Cambodia did as chair of ASEAN was to essentially scuttle a resolution that was supposed to um, mention the South China Sea. So they couldn't, couldn't do that. And even though they always have these photo ops at the end where everybody's supposed to uh, embrace and, and, and uh, hold hands, this is more uh, like what really happens, or even this when they start actually literally fighting each other. But in, uh, as I mentioned, in 2012, that ASEAN failed to reach consensus on handling disputes in the South China Sea, and it rejected the uh, compromise wording on a joint communique. And in 40 years of, of ASEAN meetings, they always put out something at the end, even some vacuous statement of some kind, but they couldn't do it that time. Uh, and it's the first time in its history that it couldn't do it. And then a few months later, again under the auspices of the Cambodian government hosting, uh, a spokesperson said that, as uh, Southeast Asian leaders have decided not to internationalize the South China Sea from now on. And that is language, the word internationalize is literally language from the Chinese spokesperson who said, we oppose the internationalization of the South China Sea. And what is meant there is we oppose uh, sending it to the UN for uh, arbitration. We oppose involving uh, other parties in our dispute. Excuse me. Yes. So where are those islands that they're building? So those islands are in the South China Sea. Yeah. They're building them there in order to, to have a foothold yeah. in the South China Sea and then claim the waters around. So the um, exclusive economic zone says that if you have a coastal area, you can claim up to 200 nautical miles out. Oh. And so this is great. I mean, you just build yourself an island in the middle of the ocean, you get 200 nautical miles radius around it. Um, <clears throat> but so the, uh, the, the whole point here is that 
the Chinese bought a seat at the ASEAN table courtesy of Cambodia, and it's really, uh, it wasn't, it's, it's, it's a few billion dollars, sure, but you know, $4.3 billion in loans to Cambodia is about 20% of Cambodia's GDP. So 20% of Cambodia's GDP, you think about it, that's a significant amount of, 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 of money for Cambodia. And um, at current debt levels in Cambodia are about 32% of GDP. So by my number, uh, it's about two thirds, almost two thirds of, of Cambodia's, what Cambodia owes is to China uh, in terms of its debt levels. So, you know, when you, uh, when your hand is in another man's pocket, as the African proverb goes, you have to walk where he walks. And that's what China is, is making Cambodia do. Uh, in 2016, Cambodia blocks mention of a permanent court of arbitration ruling, which was favorable towards the Philippines against China in a, uh, another joint communique with, uh, at that time, Laos was chair. Uh, <clears throat> but it's really not just China calling the shots. I mean, you have a situation in Cambodia where the prime minister is getting more and more uh, agitated and has said that uh, he could arrest anybody um, uh, who criticizes him within seven hours uh, for a comment made on Facebook. So just a, a couple of weeks ago, a man uh, wrote on Facebook calling the government authoritarian. He was immediately arrested, which I would say is the definition of irony, right? I mean, you call the government authoritarian and they come and arrest you. Uh, so so it, 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 I think they've, they've proven their point there. Um, <clears throat> but he's even gone to to the point of threatening to beat up protesters outside an ASEAN Australia summit back in March. Um, <clears throat> he said, and this is really, I mean, you know, this is kind of this uh, strange thinking, but you know how the French, uh, the, uh, a French king once said, le test est moi, the state, it is I. This, uh, so the Prime Minister of Cambodia thinks that ASEAN without Hun Sen, that's, he speaks of himself in the third person, is not ASEAN. Uh, <clears throat> and, and that is because he'll just say, you know, he, he can't meet or, they won't show up for the meeting, and then they won't be able to make any decision because Cambodia will be missing. So China's largest goes beyond ASEAN as well. I mean, you've got countries like Timor-Leste, which is a country I worked in with uh, the United Nations Development Program, the, one of the world's newest countries, literally half of an island in Indonesia. And the Chinese have built an embassy there. That's quite significant. This is the US uh, embassy compound with the governor's residence. I used to play tennis there. But the Chinese have built a, a, a new Ministry of Foreign Affairs for Timor-Leste, for East Timor. Um, they've built also a presidential palace for them. So they're, it's very much in these uh, prestige projects, architectural projects that they're very interested in, in building. And of course, what does Timor-Leste have? It's got the Timor Gap, which has huge natural resource uh, uh, gas uh, reserves there that have already been, you know, some of which have been tapped, as well as some of the deepest ocean you can find. So you can navigate a submarine undetected in that area. <clears throat> this is all happening in the absence of American leadership. We've pulled out of the trade deals, uh, democracy is a global retreat. I don't have to mention Putin and uh, uh, his recent election, his recent sham election, uh, Xi Jinping with no term limits. Uh, you have uh, literally uh, violence happening outside the uh, Turkish embassy in, in, the, in Washington, D.C., where uh, supporters of the uh, president of Turkey, Erdogan, uh, beat up people uh, right on our soil. In um, e Egypt, you have Mubarak here as a military sort of uh, outfit, and then the current president, also a, a general. In Thailand, the, uh, the prime minister is an unelected general. Uh, so uh, all of this is happening while, of course, our president is calling uh, the media the enemy of the, pe of the American people. And this is language that reminds me, actually, of what the Khmer Rouge, uh, the people who killed 1.7 million people in Cambodia, used to say, that everybody against them was enemies of the people. And this is just a, uh, a documentary that was made interviewing one of their leaders using that term. So we have a, a strange situation uh, all over the world. Freedom has shrunk in Southeast Asia. Cambodia, I've mentioned, uh, um, I haven't actually gone into the opposition being dissolved, but they have been dissolved. <coughs> leaders getting jailed. Uh, in exile in Thailand and Cambodia, Facebook posts leading to arrest in Malaysia. You have a 92-year-old former prime minister running under the opposition party banner. Uh, in the Philippines, you have a president who says that he killed someone as a teenager, and then his press secretary says he thinks the president was kidding. He's not sure, maybe. Uh, so it's hard, it's hard. These are very strange times. Uh, but there is some opposition. I mean, even these posters in China suggest that Xi Jinping isn't um, uh, uh, wanted as leader forever. Um, but there's, of course, a lot of um, 
a, a lot of surveillance and, and censorship and the ability of people to communicate. So, so apparently a few weeks ago, this, um, well, uh, last year rather, um, at a summit uh, between Xi Jinping and President Obama, there was, uh, there was just this, this, you know, Winnie the Pooh and Tigger, and uh, this was too controversial, so they had to ban it. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I love the fact that the legs are even in the same exact <laughs> So whoever saw this was brilliant. I mean, it was just brilliant. Anyhow, um, how far am I already? Is it 25 minutes yet? Uh, you have about uh, five, six, seven, eight minutes. Okay, so I've got a few more minutes. I've got, I've, uh, I'll just wrap up with, with returning to, to my beloved Cambodia, where, where really, I mean, I don't want to be alarmist here, but it's, it's literally becoming a kind of province of, of China and a wholly owned subsidiary. Uh, you have a uh, prime minister who is, of course, courting uh, the Chinese president and, sell, and, and translating, you know, the, he has his government translate Xi Jinping's book, Get the Governance of China by Xi Jinping, uh, into the Cambodian language and promoting it for uh, Cambodians to read as a kind of model of how to govern. Um, here, uh, uh, deceased now, a government official uh, holding the English language version of that book. Um, at least it wasn't little and red, but you know it reminds me of the past, right? I mean, this is the kind of thing that you're uh, you're seeing more and more of. Um, and I don't know, maybe some of you saw this. This was a few weeks ago. Uh, this the National People's Congress. A lady in red uh, was asking a um, question to uh, at the National People's Congress at the press conference. And this was a question, Travis. It's, it's, I won't bother reading it, but it's long and sycophantic, scripted question that that was approved by the authorities. And then the woman in blue is just, can't stand it, rolling her eyes at, at this uh, really long question. The answer was like half the, 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 the length of the question. But, uh, but that's, that's the extent of it. Of course, she gets, she, gets, uh, uh, she gets banned as a search term in China and, and then gets fired because she did this. And you know, this is the kind of thing that, that can happen these days. And you get hugs. Uh, again, here from the foreign minister of China with the prime minister of Cambodia, uh, where he at least didn't do this, which is with the prime minister of Thailand. Uh, but uh, but you know this is this is sad. I mean, Cambodian Cambodian democracy has been gutted. Um, I don't really care if the argument is sometimes that you know there was never democracy to begin with in Cambodia, so there's nothing lost. Uh, but I would say that uh, democracy is less. The Cambodians are less free today than they were a year ago, uh, two years ago, 10 years ago, maybe even 20 years ago. The opposition leader is exiled. His um, replacement is jailed. Uh, his deputy is in exile. And documents uh, published by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs retell, revis revise history, essentially. They literally print, uh, published a document, a white paper called To Tell the Truth. Um, <clears throat> and National Democratic Institute, uh, which is a UN uh, democracy promotion agency, uh, expelled from Cambodia, Radio Free Asia, which uh, promotes uh, independent news in Cambodia, also shuttered. Uh, one of two English language newspapers shuttered, the other one under assault. And the wicked thing is that they're using uh, tax uh, regulations to kind of shutter these organizations. So the Cambodia Daily got a tax bill for $6.4 million out of the blue, told to pay in 30 days. Otherwise, no, non-negotiable. So they're using um, bureaucracy to essentially uh, 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 close organizations they don't like. Uh, when the opposition party was dissolved, the uh, National Assembly voted to reallocate the seats. And so they gave the seats of a party that had won 45, almost 45% of the votes, this is in blue, to parties that won about 3, 4% of the votes. They just reallocated all the seats. It's, somehow this made sense to them, but it's yes. quite incredible. Um, you have critics of the government getting killed. Uh, there, there's Kem Lay here, shot in a uh, Chevron-owned gas station in Cambodia for talking about a report about the uh, uh, prime minister's family owning uh, hundreds of millions, if not a billion dollars worth of the economy. And um, his funeral was attended by a million uh, people, and the authorities tried to stop it by by uh, uh, shutting down gas stations along the funeral procession route so that people can refuel along the way. But it's still, it still got a million people out there in a country of currently 15 million people. Anyhow, here's, here's uh, the Prime Minister's answer to what's going on in Cambodia. He wrote this in a, uh, or it was quoted in a report by the Council of Ministers about uh, 
about uh, the situation in Cambodia. It says, real democracy in Cambodia has not been set back or fallen. Instead, it has been protected and strengthened in accordance with the principles of the rule of law the, for the great benefit of the people and nation. Only fake democracy has been abolished. And you can see the sort of echo of fake this, fake that, and now you've got fake democracy, even though that's really the only thing that was left in Cambodia. So those words remind me vaguely of this one time when the prime minister was kicking a soccer ball. Um, and I don't know, it just feels like a gut punch, frankly. Anyhow, I'll end it there. Uh, I don't have my cards on me, but I'll, I, I put it up here on the screen, and I'm happy to entertain questions you may have. Yes? Um, excellent presentation. Um, actually, my son um, pivoted about two years ago as an economist and went to Cambodia and is doing nonprofit work. Right now. So wow, wonderful. Very, very fell in love with the country. Um, how do you interpret what's going on with North Korea and South Korea um, and the possible negotiations with Trump? Because it could be, my interpretation, isolating China from meddling in that part of the world. Well, and, and Kim Jong-un showed up in China almost uh, unannounced on a train, right? This is to make sure that who's still part of the conversation. Xi Jinping calls, uh, you know, is relevant and won't allow his, his best buddy Kim Jong-un to, to be left uh, making a deal with the U.S. I mean, the, the thing with, with the, 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 the worry everyone had uh, about this, uh, this summit between President Trump and uh, Kim uh, Jong-un is that, okay, if things don't go, uh, if, okay, maybe uh, President Trump thinks he's going to meet Kim Jong-un and bring back the nuclear weapons to the U.S. of Kim, Kim Jong-un, right? He's just going to denuclearize North Korea and he's just going to haul those nuclear uh, weapons back to the U.S. Um, but what if that doesn't happen? Then where else do you go? You've reached already the highest level of possible negotiation. There's nothing, no, no one else above these people to negotiate. Uh, and so uh, is the next thing possibly war simply because you can't get what you want and so obviously you gave it a last shot and now it's got to go uh, you know, south as a result. But this morning in the newspaper, it appears that there Oh yeah, South Korea. Korea. In the Korean War, which is in yes. since 1950. So yeah, so I mean, uh, of course, uh, South Korea is currently uh, the president. Of South Korea is somebody who's friendly towards uh, reconciliation with North Korea, and so that makes sense. And in fact, it was as it was described to me, the uh, one of the uh, the way that the summit happened for the, the arrangement was this uh, advisor for the South Korean government was visiting the White House, talking to some you know National Security Council staff. President Trump walks in and suddenly has a conversation with him and says, we're gonna have a summit. And it's like, it's literally a kind of, you know, nobody <laughs> knew anything about it and, and decided on the cuff like that. Hopefully things don't turn out. Of course, the hope is that on the off chance that things could turn out well, and you know, you could actually have progress on, on this front, then, then today's news and, and future news might be very good. But uh, again, the, I wouldn't put the odds as particularly high per se. So sure. one more question. Yes. So you mentioned a lack of American leadership. What, what do you think America should be doing? Uh, well, <clears throat> one of the things it has done is to, you know, have um, resolutions passed by the Senate. McCain, uh, Durbin, and others have said, you know, those who undermine Cambodian democracy need to be punished, as in they shouldn't get visas to come to the U.S., which is good. That's that's happening. But I mean, obviously they're not going to come to the U.S. They know better than to come to the U.S. But what about their assets only here? Shouldn't those be frozen? Uh, they probably have mansions and things that, that they've squirreled money into. Um, these things, they should be designated. There's a, there's a category called Foreign Designated Nationals, FDNs. And once you're named in this list, you can't do any banking at all. I mean, it's, it's know your customer and, uh, and you, you just, you're just banned from the international banking system because the U.S. controls uh, so much of, the, of, of, of that architecture. I mean, you had, you had one, of, one of the people I showed here in, in my slides, um, I won't name who, uh, apparently showed up at a branch of Standard Charter Bank in Cambodia and attempted to deposit $10 million in it. I mean, he's a government official who, who's paid maybe $1,000, $1,500 a month. And attempt, attempts to deposit $10 million in cash the, the branch, instead of taking his money, which you know, I think a lot of a lot of uh, branch managers would like ten million dollars in there uh, as as a as an added uh, account, um, chose to shut down the branch and the operations of Standard Charter for a few years in order to avoid a situation like that. Instead of continuing to uh, entertain such requests, 
I mean, uh, their desire is to put money into into the international banking system so that they can access them if something goes wrong in the country and, and send, them, send, send their kids uh, away and so on. So uh, sanctions of that nature, uh, the garment sector in Cambodia is huge, uh, represents billions and billions of dollars. The primary exports of Cambodia is garments. If you were to touch that, the government would listen immediately to anything you want to say about the potential for um, for, for trade sanctions of any kind that, that impact that, that sector in particular. Um, it's hard to imagine that, that anything would happen to it though because uh, you'd have to have justification for that. And uh, is this enough? I mean, you got Vietnam next door, it's not democratic, never been democratic. Laos, also same story. I mean, a lot of, a lot of people keep saying, like, look at the neighbors, they're all not democratic. And so the, the story is different with Cambodia in that for the last 25 years, there was, there was something in Cambodia and it's now gone. And, Lots of billions of dollars were invested in Cambodia to, to promote that democracy, and to see it all disappear like this is uh, is, a, is is a, is sad. It's sad. I mean, um, somebody should should try to do something about it. Will you be able to stay a little bit after? Yes, the absolutely. Okay, great. Happy. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, it represents our thing, which is good as the new cool, which means the things that you're doing today actually here impacting our lives um, impact somebody else across the world which is in this case this was made by a woman trying to lift her family out of poverty from Africa and so and there's a pin good as the new cool so thank you for being here today thank you and wow Appreciate I know this is gonna make a difference in what I think about on the weekend um,